everyone. Welcome to those of you that are here on campus and those of you that are joining us on Zoom and virtually. So we are now having today the 24th Annual Lesbedeck Lecture. I am Roger Schrader, the holder of the Lewis J. Lesbedeck SVD Chair in Mission and Culture here at CTU. Let us begin with acknowledging the land upon which Chicago sits. Yesterday, many states celebrated Indigenous Peoples Day. We acknowledge this land, which was once occupied and revered by the Council of the Three Fires, comprised of the Ojibwe, Adawa, and Potawatomi nations. We thank these early inhabitants of Chicago for the way they revered this generous land. Let us also remember all people of the Americas. In particular, my mind is drawn to our Lakota friends in South Dakota, with whom CTU has had a relationship for almost 40 years. So we also remember them and all indigenous peoples of the Americas. We remember them, we remember this land. I now invite President Barbara Reed to offer her welcome. Thank you, Roger. Hello and welcome, everyone. We're so pleased that you're here for this 24th annual Luzbatech Lecture. And if you're new to CTU, allow me, if you would, to describe briefly who we are. I see from the people in the room you're old friends, but there may be a number of people on Zoom who ha are joining us for the first time. So for their sake, um, just to let you know, the CTU was formed in 1968 when three men's communities, the Passionists, Franciscans, and Servites, joined efforts to respond to the call to rethink seminary formation in the wake of Vatican II. And as you're aware, today marks uh, the 60th anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council. CTU is only about 54 years old, though. And um, so we were deliberately founded in this urban context, close to the University of Chicago and other schools of theology, where we could easily engage in ecumenical, intercultural, and interreligious exchanges. So fast forward to today, now there are men religious from 23 communities that are the corporate owners of the school. They make up about 40% of the student body. Another 20% of our students are women religious, and the other 40% are lay women and men, preparing for a great variety of ministries in the church. Our mission is to prepare effective leaders for the church, ready to witness to Christ's good news of justice, love, and peace. One of CTU's hallmarks from the beginning has been world mission and interculturality, thanks in large part to the international students that come to us from the SVD and other missionary communities. We are delighted that Professor Emeritus Stephen Bevins, SVD, who held the Lisbethek chair, is our presenter tonight. If you are new to CTU, we hope you will join us often for our lectures and programs or come take a course. And now I'd like to turn you back to Professor Roger Schrader, who will tell you more about the Luzbatech Lecture and our presenter, Stephen Bevins. Thank you. So our lecture this evening is named after Louis Lesbetek, SVD. Here's his um, portrait here. I borrowed this from the library today, they don't mind. Um, Louis Lesbetek was a missionary anthropologist who pointed to the important dynamic between mission and culture. His first book, his major book, was a publication of Church and Cultures. This was in 1963, so this was during beginning of Vatican II, so he is already anticipating much of what Vatican II would be doing, pointing to the importance of understanding culture, culture of all peoples. Huh? 
And as we know in Vatican II, then would point the church in the new direction of looking at the seeds of the word of God in every culture. He later on did a major revision of the book, a book called New Perspectives in Missiological Anthropology. I was with him in Rome when he was working on this book, and it was a major work that he did, a complete update in light of the changes of Vatican II and other changes after that. His work is appreciated and valued by conciliar Protestants, evangelicals, and of course by Catholics. I know we used to meet at Techni for our American Society of Missiology meetings, and the majority of the participants were those of um, conciliar, evangelical, um, Protestant denominations, and a number of them would come to me and they'd say, where is Louis Lesbetek buried? We'd like to go to the cemetery just to go to his, to his grave. Huh? So he's very highly regarded for the work that he did and very early work that he did, and others then would build upon it. This lecture is also being co-sponsored by the Committee of World Mission of CTU. I'd now like to introduce our speaker for today. It's a real honor for me to introduce a colleague, contrary, collaborator, and friend, Stephen Bevins, SVD. Steve taught in the Philippines for nine years, received his doctorate degree from the University of Notre Dame, and he was on the faculty of CTU for 29 years until his retirement in 2015. Steve is still involved in things here at CTU. He's retired, but you know, retirement means different things to different people. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Steve has published many books, among which are Models of Contextual Theology, which was 20 years ago now, huh? and how it's um, been used over the years by many different peoples. Also, an introduction to theology and global perspective and a century of Catholic mission. I also had the honor of co-authoring two books with Steve, Constance and Context and Prophetic Dialogue. Um, Steve is such a great mentor, a collaborator, and friend, and I've learned so much by working together with Steve. And many of Steve's books are used as textbooks here at CTU. Yeah. Steve is currently writing a missionary ecclesiology. This has been in his heart and his mind for 20 years, and he's finally getting a chance to, to do it. Um, Steve is one of three Vatican-appointed commissioners on the World Council of Churches Commission on World Mission and Evangelism. He does much work with other Christian denominations and churches in so many ways. And that's just continuing to grow. We were talking last night how Steve says, I'm still peaking. Well, you know, they're moving in new directions, huh? Yeah. Steve was the first holder of the Lesbian Chair. He held it for 17 years. So how appropriate it is for him to be our Lesbian Lecturer today. So help me in welcoming Steve Evans. Thanks so much, first of all, to Barbara for a warm welcome, as always, and for you, Roger, um, for a, a wonderful, wonderful introduction. It is really an honor to be here, uh, to be on the podium where I introduced, uh, oh, about uh, 12 or so uh, wonderful uh, Lusbatech lecturers uh, in the beginning of this series. And uh, it's really, really an honor to be here, as always, and uh, uh, wonderful to be in person after so many years of um, Zoom and uh, uh, still wonderful and welcome all those who are on Zoom. But it's really wonderful to have a, almost a full house here today uh, in, in our room. Well, my topic for my lecture this evening is Pachamama Christianity, the Pan-Amazonian Synod, and indigenous religious identity. And I want to begin by describing a theft and a ceremony. In the early hours of the morning of October 21st, 2019, 
two right-wing Catholics, one of whom was a faux cleric who went by the name of Father David and claimed to be related to Mussolini, broke into the church of Santa Maria in Traspontina in Rome. They stole several carved wooden statues of a naked pregnant woman that had been on display during the Pan-Amazonian Synod that was nearing its conclusion later that week. As a video that was taken at the scene shows, the statues were taken from the church to a nearby bridge and thrown into the Tiber River. Several days later, in a heartfelt apology on October 25th, Pope Francis referred to the stolen statues as images of Pachamama, whose identity was explained by the journalist John Allen as a female fertility figure representing Mother Earth, venerated by peoples in the Andes and portions of the Amazon. The statues had, had been recovered by the Italian police, the Pope explain, explained. But as Bishop of Rome, he asked pardon of the persons who were offended by this act. The statues had first made their appearance on October 4th at a service to celebrate the feast of St. Francis of Assisi. It was presided over by the Pope, but conducted by a group of indigenous Amazonians. As a video of the ceremony shows, at one point, these indigenous women and men, accompanied by a Franciscan friar, danced and chanted in a circle around two of the statues and several symbols from the Amazon region. And then afterwards, several in the group presented Pope Francis with a ring, with one of the statues, and with a necklace. In each instant, instance, the person presenting the object made the sign of the cross and received a blessing from the Pope. The ceremony ended with the planting of a small tree in the garden as St. Francis's Canticle of the Sun was sung in Italian. Was this a Catholic Christian ceremony? The presence of the Pope and several cardinals certainly signaled that it was, as did the actions of the sign of the cross and the singing of Francis's canticle. Several conservative Catholics, however, did not think so at all. They judged the ceremony as decidedly pagan, focusing especially on the statues. And their ne negative judgment ranged from seeing them as demonic symbols of pagan idolatry to an uncritical embrace of all things indigenous. In a critical article that suggests that the Synod should be called the Pachamama Synod, journalist Terry Mattingly quotes a description of the ceremony by Christopher R. Altieri. Altieri describes the indigenous participants in the October 4th ceremony as led by a woman 
in native ceremonial dress, in something that looked for all the world like prayer of some sort, and bowed low to the ground, facing the figures of two pregnant women in a boat at the center of the mat, on which the apparent leader of the ceremony and other participants had placed things that looked very much like a symbolic offering. The statues were labeled as idols by Roberto de Mattei in his description of their presence at the Synod's opening procession from St. Peter's tomb to the Synod Hall. And Mattei spoke of the October 6th Via Crucis, Way of the Cross, that commemorated the martyrs of the Amazon as blasphemous. Mattei's overall judgment of the Synod was that it promoted a new indigenous cosmology and idolatrous cults inside the Catholic Church. After the statue's theft by some courageous Catholics, as Mattei described them, former head of the Vatican's Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, Cardinal Gerhard Miller, remarked that the great mistake was to bring the idols into the church, not putting them out. Because according to the law of God, the first commandment, idolatry is a grave sin and is not to be mixed with Christian liturgy. Pope Francis and others, however, defended the presence of the statues and saw them as neutral or even Christian symbols. <clears throat> Although he spoke in his apology of the statues of the statues as Pachamama, he said that they had been displayed in Santa Maria in Traspontina Church without idolatrous intentions. Christopher Altieri reported that when the Pope received the statue presented to him in the Vatican Gardens, a voice can be heard on the video behind the Pope saying, Our Lady of the Amazon, she is Our Lady of Amazonia. Indeed, in the Andean region of Western Latin America that shares many religious beliefs with parts of the Amazon region, Christian evangelization has adapted the pervasive belief and veneration of Pachamama to refer to the Virgin Mary. Vatican spokesman Paolo Ruffini denied any religious significance to the statues, insisting they were symbols of life. Referring to the presence of one of the statues at the Amazonian Way of the Cross, Jesuit Francisco Lopez, who works in the Amazon as part of an itinerant team of ministers, also insisted that the statues represent life. But he continued, we were all born from a mother, and we all have a mother who was pregnant and delivered us to life. It's a mystery, life itself, that signifies in a way that God is also mother. He's engendered us and cares for life. This debate between conservative Catholics and a more open-minded Francis papacy might be described as a debate between those who view the Amazonian indigenous people's faith as a misguided and dangerous syncretism, one that compromises the core of Christianity, or a bold form of enculturation of Christian faith that has taken on an Amazonian face. Such an enculturation would be a recognition of the power of Amazonian cultural and religious traditions, according to which indigenous people live together with their Christianity. 
In any case, we see here a dramatic interplay between mission and culture, the exploration of which is the purpose of this series of lectures in honor of my confrere and friend, Father Louis Luspatek, SVD. What went on at the Synod in regards to mission and culture? Central to the concerns of the Pan-Amazonian Synod was the urgent need to reverse the impending ecological disaster that is looming in the region. And because the Amazon represents the lungs of the world, its ecological integrity is crucial for the ecological integrity of our entire planet. This is why the Synod spoke so positively about indigenous culture, spirituality, and religion as a help for developing a vision for a more integral understanding of our world. The Synod's preparatory and final documents, as well as Francis's post-Synodal apostolic exhortation, Querida Amazonia, deeply recognized the truth of indigenous wisdom and its potential for the ecological conversion that is needed today. Much of that truth and potential depends on an openness to the basic cosmo vision of the indigenous peoples in the area. Trying to live in harmony with oneself so much of that truth and potential depends on an openness to the basic cosmo vision of the indigenous peoples of the area. It is a vision of trying to live in harmony with oneself, with nature, with human beings, and with the supreme being, given that there is an intercommunication within the whole cosmos. Such an understanding is characterized by the connectivity and harmony of relations between water, the territory and nature, communal life and culture, God and the different spiritual forces. In his study of the Makuna people of the Northwest Amazon, anthropologist Kai Arhem begins his chapter on the Makuna world with the following description. And we might take it as a description of the Amazonian worldview in general. In the Makuna world, every tangible form is more than it appears. The visible world of ordinary experience also has an invisible and intangible dimension that the Makuna refer to as hey, the world of powerful spirits and deified ancestors. In this other dimension, rocks and rivers are alive, and animals and plants are people. There is a boundless universe of continuities and relatedness in which rivers and forests, humans and animals, living and dead, all form part of an integrated whole, an encompassing community of beings and things. The Western distinction between nature and culture dissolves and loses its meaning. The Synod's final document calls for a rich dialogue with these indigenous non-Christian traditions, especially in their relationship with the forest and Mother Earth. The wisdom of ancestral peoples, the document declares, affirms that Mother Earth has a feminine face. 
This is the significance of Pachamama, for whom all life comes. Indeed, as Pope Francis remarked in his meeting with indigenous peoples in 2018 in Peru, the worldview and wisdom of the Amazonian people has much to teach those of us who do not belong to their culture. The Synod's final document calls for a conversion to this culture, which for all practical purposes is one that takes seriously indigenous religions, since the line between culture and religion is always a very blurred one. In his classic book on enculturation, Constructing Local Theologies, our late beloved colleague Robert Schreider observed that it cannot be insignificant that so many languages of the world do not even have a word for what we call religion. For many peoples, it is a way of being and living so tied up with being part of a particular culture, that it is impossible to imagine living that way outside the culture. In the Amazonian context in particular, as anthropologist Norman Witten insists, the connection between cultural and religious worldviews is inseparable. In his post-synodal, apostolic exhortation, Querida Amazonia, Pope Francis recalls a document of the Peruvian Amazonian bishops from the late 1970s, in which they acknowledged that the people of the region had been initially evangelized, with the result that local people's Christian faith is marked with certain features of popular Catholicism that are now something that the people have made their own, even changing their meaning and handing them down from generation to generation. Some of these practices may well be the origin of the rituals, prayers, and statues that the indigenous Amazonians brought to the Synod. The Pope goes on to defend these cautioning that other Catholics should not simply judge them to be superstition or paganism. They are rather, he says, religious practices that arise spontaneously from the life of peoples. While they may seem strange to us, the Pope suggests that if we know how to distinguish the wheat from the weeds, and so referring to Jesus' parable in Matthew 13, we will see how the faith once received becomes embodied in a culture and is constantly passed on. The Pope continues this line of thought in the following paragraph of the exhortation, obviously referring to the controversy at the Synod over the various rituals and the Pachamama statues. It is possible, he says, to take up an indigenous symbol in some way without necessarily considering it as idolatry. A myth charged with spiritual meaning can be used to advantage and not always considered a pagan error. Certainly, the Pope says, such symbols and myths need gradual purification and maturation. But as it were, they can exist side by side with Christian symbols, myths, and stories. The true missionary, he says, and pastoral worker will see that these expressions of indigenous religiosity and spirituality address real needs, even if they are at times imperfect, partial, or mistaken religious expressions. So can we then speak 
of a Pachamama Christianity. I do believe we can, at least in some way. Pope Francis seems to hint at this in his remarks in Querida Amazonia that I've just quoted. I believe we can regard the Catholic Christianity of the peoples of the Amazon as an instance of contextualized Christian theology or enculturation, one that has emerged not from theologians from above, but from the indigenous people themselves. One might also even see it as a religious perspective that contains, as comparative theologian Catherine Cornell describes, as religious hybridity. That is, a more unresolved tension between cultural religious identity and evangelizing Christianity. And so even a dual or multi-religious belonging. Kai Arhem writes of an extensive, though intermittent, presence of Catholic missionaries over the last centuries, a presence that is quite strong among the Makuna today. However, he, as he points out, despite the changes that Christianity and with it modernity has brought, Makuna traditions remain vital and compelling. Ritual life is not only intact, but seems to have intensified as a reaction to the mounting pressures from the outside. Nurtured by the past, Makuna cultural traditions are vigorously alive in the present. This is precisely where I would place the Pachamama Christianity of the Amazon. As their presence at the Synod evidenced, indigenous peoples are clearly Christian, but they are also steeped in their indigenous cultural ways and cosmovision. They live, it seems to me, in two cultural and religious worlds and seem to thrive in this situation. Their Christianity might still, meet, still need to be refined and purified through the difficult but necessary journey of continuous enculturation, but their indigenous worldview of harmony and interrelationship of all things is a valid way of shaping their Christian faith. It can also be immensely helpful for all of us in the struggle for a more ecologically sensitive Christianity. Catherine Cornell suggests that hybridity or multi-religious belonging, while perhaps problematic theologically, offers a promise as well. It can function as a critical mirror or an indication of what might be lacking within a particular religion. This is, I believe, Pope Francis and the Pan-Amazonian Synod's perspective on the wisdom of indigenous culture, religion, and spirituality, and how it can critique distorted understandings of anthropocentrism and individuality especially as these have developed in Western modernity. More constructively, as Francis says in Carita Amazonia, applying what he says about the poor in Evangelii Gaudium, the people of the Amazon have much to teach us. Their own simplicity, their religious view of the relatedness of all things, and the importance of every creature can inspire us and help us undergo what Pope John Paul II and Francis himself has called ecological conversion. Cornell speaks 
in the context of those who claim to be spiritual and not religious, but I think she echoes Pope Francis and the Synod when she says that rather than condemning them, one might recognize that they still do identify with Christianity and wish to belong to the church. The challenge is thus to find new ways to educate Christians and to introduce them to the spiritual riches of the tradition. To do that, however, is first to accept the validity of a people's worldview and take them where they are. So some words of conclusion, a um, little longer conclusion, but nevertheless a conclusion. I learned of the theft of the Pachamama statues when on the day it happened, I received a request from the editor of the British Catholic Weekly, The Tablet. The editor, Brian Walsh, asked if I would write a piece in defense of Pope Francis's and the Synod's open attitude toward indigenous culture and religion. The church needs a missiologist's voice, he wrote me. As I worked on the piece within the short five-day deadline that Brian gave me, I became fascinated with the implications of the theft and the rancorous debate that was going on. And it struck me that some deeper reflection on it might be appropriate for a longer presentation, focusing on the relationship between faith and culture and mission and culture. The significance of the event of the theft of the Pachamama statues in 2019 and the controversy that followed was also brought home to me in an important book that I read last year by theologian Ross Cain entitled Syncretism and Christian Tradition. Cain traces the history of syncretism from its origins in an essay by Plutarch in the second century after Christ. For Plutarch, it meant how the inhabitants of the island of Crete united against their enemies, hence syncretism. Over the centuries, however, however it developed into what Cain calls a 10-letter, four-letter word among missiologists and, 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 and missionaries and missiologists in the 20th century. So an idea that was for centuries simply the description of how religion mixed with culture became in the last century or so what he calls a Christian epithet that described the unholy and unorthodox mixing of Christianity and culture. How this happened, Cain argues quite convincingly, is that any attempt to express Christianity by the subjects of a non-Western culture came under the judgment not only of Western colonialism, but also racial superiority. Very, very ironically, Christian missionaries in the 19th century particularly failed to recognize that their own brand of Christianity was also a mixture of local cultural values and practices together with their Christian faith. Their condemnation of African Asian, Latin American, Oceanian, and indigenous practices and efforts of subsequent enculturation came under the judgment of what African American philosopher George Yancey calls the white gaze. As Cain expresses it, an epistemology abstracted from place 
that presumes impartiality and the right to define the world around itself. What we see in the controversy on which I've reflected upon is crucial, I believe, for a better understanding of the relationship between mission and culture. The question is, who really decides what is orthodox or not? Will theology and the practice of Christianity be the result of a true dialogue between faith and culture or context of participants in that culture and context? Will it be the result of what my friend and colleague, Tone Sison, who is here, calls the art of indigenous enculturation? Or will it be decided by people who still claim cultural or racial superiority in the West. Pope Francis, I believe, particularly in his teaching and leadership in developing a listening and synodal church, is leading us in the first direction. Many of his critics, of course, would like to go in the other direction. I believe, of course, that Pope Francis' direction is the right one. It is certainly a direction that is filled with risks, but it's also one that's filled with great and exciting possibilities, and not only for the peoples of the Amazon, but for those of us who struggle to find ways to make Christianity and relevant in our own times and cultures. Rather than beginning from a stance that asks first about the limits of enculturation, I believe we need to start from one that looks to new possibilities that our cultural and contextual situation offers for new ways of understanding and practicing our faith. Pope Francis has spoke of proceeding in this task with daring prudence. And this would mean to refer to Ton Sison again to proceed from the edge of genius. Those who practice what I have called Pachamama Christianity, as Francis insisted against his critics, have much to teach us indeed. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. A wonderful talk and very engaging and a little challenging, which is good. Yeah, that's very good, huh? Challenging for all of us, too, yeah. Oh, we really do have a full room here. I see that here and on Zoom as well. So can you uh, take the questions yourself or do you want me to? I can, I can take them. Sure. Okay, good. Yeah, so sure. we, have, we have people in the room that we have a microphone on either side. If you want to ask a question, they'll bring the microphone to you. And um, Jorge is on the uh, chat, so he also will be looking at questions that come to the chat. So I encourage those on Zoom to also post your questions on the chat. So um, who would like to get us started here? Uh, we'll start with people in the room, and then we'll move to the chat, okay? All right. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for this important um, and challenging conversation. I was wondering, uh, well, it was pretty clear to me that undergirding a lot of this incident was the ideologies uh, surrounding patriarchy. And mm. I think about like ecofeminist Catholic theologians that have already talked about that the earth as being the body of God and uh, thinking about like the parallels between the way that we treat the earth is like treating the body of God and then these people just literally throwing this body into a river um, and thinking about the kind of antagonism against an image that is a fertile woman being a vessel of the divine in any way seeming scary or dangerous I just thought that it was pretty evident of 
patriarchal ideology. And I was just wondering what you thought of that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think, I think you said it very eloquently. And uh, as I have learned so much from Barbara Reed and our teaching for some 20 years together, uh, a course in, in, in feminist theology and uh, Bible, um, patriarchy is under everything. It's under everything. Uh, and so, yes, I, 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 clearly, uh, I clearly see that. I mean, there could be much more uh, of an analysis of that, I think, uh, and, and I think it's really true. You know, the, uh, the, the body of a woman, scary. You know, that, that's, I think that's what, what uh, 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 some people would think. And, and so, yes, thank you for that very insightful comment. I really appreciate it. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, this is an excellent, excellent combination of most of the cultures uh, in Latin America, especially looking at the Andinos and the Amazonias and all that. Um, my question will be, or my concern will be, how do we extend this uh, when it comes to African cultures? Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, you know, it, it, just a, a kind of aside, I, I actually crossed it out of my, of my text to, to try to make the sentences shorter, <laughs> you know. But um, uh, actually, I, I, I did make a remark in my text that, that um, the uh, final document of the Synod also talks about um, African indigenous customs in Amazonia. So one thing, you know, so, uh, so that they actually talk, they don't talk that much about it, but it's there. But I think what I've offered here is really kind of a methodology, uh, a, a kind of a framework. So I think you could probably take uh, some uh, practices in Africa and maybe do the same analysis and everything. In fact, um, Ross Kane, who I, I mentioned, who's, uh, I'm a real fan of his, uh, I, I just love that book. It, it, uh, you know, it was like mind-blowing and mind-changing. Uh, and and um, uh, uh, he actually was a, a missionary in Tanzania for a number of years and uh, uh, uses some examples from, uh, uh, from African um, uh, Rafic, African traditional religion uh, in, 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 his, uh, in his work. Uh, and there's one, there's a really beautiful one um, about um, uh, two villages, I think it's Tanzania, uh, let's say would be, would be warring or having difficulties and problems. And the way they make peace is that they sacrifice a cow. And then they come together and they have a they have a, a a banquet. And he said, you know, this is this is Christian. I mean, you know, it, it it's it, it it's you know, and and that Christians could use this kind of thing, you know, uh, and and I think the the example of the sacrifice cow, you know, might be one way to understand, you know, God's love for us and making peace among us as as uh, we, we hear in, in Ephesians. You have to be careful of the sacrifice stuff. I see Barbara kind of going, mm, you know, but nevertheless, you know, in different cultures and different places, I think uh, this, this is possible. So, yeah, I think what I've done is tried to lay out a framework here about this. And my thing, I, I said it briefly at the end, but it, it's something that I, 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 came, I came upon in my own journey uh, a, a, a number of, uh, about four or five years ago. Um, all through my, my career, I, I speak to a lot of Protestants and evangelicals, and the first question they ask me when I speak on enculturation is, what are the limits of enculturation? I just think that's the wrong question. I think it should be, what are the possibilities that are in a culture, that are in a context? And let's, let's take the risk you know, let's, let's try. Pope Francis in Evangelii Gaudium said the greatest risk is simply to repeat orthodox language, uh, uh, you know, by rote. 
and people don't understand it. It's orthodox, but people don't understand it. Let's take some risks and see if we can engage people from their experiences, from their cultures, from their contexts. So, Jorge. If, uh, we have two questions from, uh, from Zoom. The first one comes from Chris, uh, Chris McNally. Actually, it's three questions into one, so okay. I'll go slowly. The first one is, is Paul's discourse in the Areopagos a scriptural precedent for Pachamama? So it's his discourse on the Areopagos, a scriptural precedent for Pachamama. The second one is, is Our Lady of Guadalupe, which depicts the Virgin Mary as a pregnant indigenous woman of Mexico, also a present for Pachamama? The third and last one. And for that matter, are the depictions of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph as your, uh, Mary and the apostles as Europeans similarly examples of how God draws close to man, of, to humanity, in every time and place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think in a, in a nuanced way, um, I, I, would say, I would say yes to all those questions. You know, uh, I, I, I think I, would, I need to uh, reflect more and, and nuance the answer. I'm not sure if there's a parallel between the unknown God of the Athenians uh, and, and Pachamama. I, I, I'm not so sure. I think Our, Our, Our Lady of Guadalupe, or the Virgin of Guadalupe, may be closer uh, to, uh, to this. Uh, but, uh, uh, but anyway, yeah. And then, yeah, uh, it, it's, uh, it's just amazing how we, um, how we actually contextualize our own religious art, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and then we take it literally you know, that Jesus probably didn't have blonde hair, you know, <laughs> and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But. Yes, please, Jorge. So, uh, okay. Our next question comes from Joe Iannone. What would a revision Petrine ministry or papacy look like in the third millennium valuing indigenous people in various cultures? Would you repeat that question, the first part particularly? So what would, what would a re-envisioned Petrine ministry, or Petrine ministry, I'm sorry, or papacy look like in the third millennium valuing indigenous people in various cultures? Mm -hmm. I think it would look a lot like what Pope Francis is trying to do and what he's trying to dream for the church. Um, you know, Pope Francis uh, is Argentinian by birth, but still by blood, of course, he's European. Uh, and, uh, and it would be very different, I think, you know, if we had uh, an African pope or we had a pope from the Solomon Islands in Papua New Guinea um, or, you know, other places. The danger would be sometimes Sometimes these bishops are more Roman than the Romans, but uh, the ones that Pope Francis is appointing definitely seem to be uh, uh, subjects in their own culture. So I, I, think, uh, I think what Francis dreams is a Catholic church. You know, what Catholic means is not universal. Catholic means a communion where all particular churches and particular cultures uh, somehow express and live out their own identity. And they are communicating with each other to challenge each other, to uh, inspire each other. It's what Roger Schrader and many of us would call in culture, interculturality. That's what, that's what uh, it is. And so I, I would love to see a church that is rich that way, that is not uh, bound by being afraid of certain phrases or certain ideas or certain practices. Certainly there are things that are, that are not correct, and Ross Kane points some of those things out. Apartheid in South Africa was a contextual theology, was an inculturation, but we can't accept that. You know, because it goes against, I think, human dignity and, and against the, the real tenets of the gospel. 
but the but the uh, but the sacrificial cow uh, could be used uh, in 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 powerful ways. Maybe not. Maybe in in Western cultures or or even Asian cultures. I don't know. Uh, but certainly in certain African cultures. Okay. Yes, please. Oh, sorry. Um, I just want to reaffirm what you had said about the you know, asking what are the limits of enculturation being the wrong question. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really like your nuance on what are the possibilities of enculturation. But I, I wanted to ask, at the, at the very, very end of your talk, uh, you said something that, that um, you know, I, I come from a culture that in this country is constantly being labeled by others. Mm -hmm. a, and you mentioned, uh, you said what I call Pachamama Christianity. Mm -hmm. So there, there you are labeling, you know, th this particular cr uh, Christianity. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering uh, if you've had a chance to see the possibilities of what those who practice it actually call themselves. Thanks, thanks, Gilberto. That's I almost didn't recognize you with the mask, oh, but sorry, I recognize your voice. It's me. Hey, <laughs> okay. Uh, um, thanks. I mean, that's that's really a good point. And and uh, when I said that, what I call what I wanted to do was step back in humility and say this is a phrase that I I just made up. Uh, I, and you know the, the people don't call it that. I don't think. Uh, but it's a phrase that I think captures something of what's going on. Uh, actually, I don't know. I think they would just talk about. Christianity or, or Amazonian Christianity or the Amazonian church. I, I, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm not an expert in that. As I say, this is more of a, a methodological exercise of the case study rather than a, a real anthropological uh, uh, um, uh, research into, into all of this. But I think you're absolutely right, and we have to be very, very careful always, you know, to uh, to recognize, um, you know, I, I actually probably all of us, but certainly, you know, particularly white Westerners, to recognize our colonial default, you know, that we just, you know, it, it's, it's original sin, <laughs> you know, we can't get out of it. And, and, and so, but so, so thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to go over here and then come back, okay? Uh, so please. Good night. I will try to express what I want to say. It's only a comment. I think we have to be careful with the images because we receive, I am from Bolivia, and we receive the images, very European images mm -hmm. of Our Lady or mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Right. And for any reason, sometimes they become uh, like I, like an idols, because people began to offer things to these mm -hmm. images, even though they are Mary, yeah. uh, Our Lady. What happened that I went to live in Spain, and I discovered that it happens also in Spain that mm -hmm. Our Lady mm -hmm. is more mm -hmm. praised than Jesus. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about Mary, but not Jesus, and talk mm -hmm. to me about yeah. Mary, but not the church. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these fraternities that have a lot of devotion to Mary, mm -hmm. they, they are not linked even with the church or with they don't have any kind of connection. It's only the lady. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what is, is this an idol? Is not an idol. So even our images, mm -hmm. I think they can yeah. become idols sometimes. Yeah. No, ab ab absolutely. And I mean, when we're, y you know, when we're in this area of enculturation and so forth, it's, it's a, it, uh, I don't know exactly the word to use. I'm thinking of a, a, a swamp or a bog where, you know, you take the wrong step and you're, <laughs> you know, you're, you know, but, but, you know, it, it, it's necessary to do, it's necessary to, uh, to face the risks. So the popular uh, religiosity and so forth. And, you know, I, I mean, uh, in, in, in some ways, um, in some ways, um, 
the images or the devotions, perhaps even better, to like Mary and so forth, she functions as God, you know? Uh, so the faith is, they may be saying the word Mary, but where the heart is going, there's, there's maybe the, 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 uh, the, the uh, parallel between the Areopagus, uh, Acts 17, and, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 uh, uh, and, and, and these kind of popular devotions. But, but the, the hearts are, are, going, are going to God. You know, even though the words might be saying something else. That's tricky, I know. <laughs> and, and, I, and I wouldn't want to push that too far. But, um, but again, I think this is a, a very important um, comment that you make, and, and I think very important for, uh, uh, for those of us who are engaged in any kind of enculturation. And then, oh, uh, please, you, you were, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I'm really, really excited about this topic. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was just a, a comment on what he was saying, and uh, you talked about it, uh, you know, the Pachamama Christianist st stuff. I think it just depends with the group or the culture in which you are at. Mm -hmm. Because what the Andinas call it is not what people like, for instance, Mapuche will call it. Mm -hmm. It's not what no, the sure. Makunas will call yeah, it. Sure. So it just depends with the group. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your sharing. I really enjoyed it very Thank much you. too. Thank you. Um, you said that the indigenous people of the Amazonia has a lot to share with us. And one of the things I picked up in the lecture is that, you know, they, you, you mentioned that they don't, they don't think of it as a religion, but a, a part of their life. And yet when Christianity was introduced to them, uh, clearly based on the European uh, worldview, there must have been some con mm -hmm. conflicts within mm -hmm. what they believe and what was introduced to them. And yet, they were able to harmonize it mm -hmm. and see it as a continuous co conversion yeah. towards uh, a, mm -hmm. a new way of life. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, there are obviously people who are struggling as Christians uh, to, to see the same worldview or to do the kind of same kind of har harmonization as what the indigenous people have done mm -hmm. with Christianity. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest for catechists, people who are doing catechetical work, to introduce into the, their program to make or to invite people to be more open to a continual conversion, even with world religions? Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I just want to uh, remark that, um, you know, in, in terms of, you know, indigenous people's faith and so, somehow despite everything, they got it, you know. Uh, just think of that lovely phrase by uh, Pope John Paul II in Redem Taurus Missio, that the Holy Spirit is the, is the primary evangelizer. Not us, you know, but, but the Spirit. That's why it, we participate in God's mission, you know, uh, 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 sometimes very badly and poorly, uh, but uh, somehow or another, you know, uh, the, the Spirit gets the better of us, <laughs> you know, sometimes anyway, not all the time. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not sure. I think I would try, I, I would try to, to uh, be, be biblical, you know, to, to, to focus on, uh, you know, uh, gospel stories and, and get people to reflect on that in the light of their own, um, the light of their own experience. Um, you know, if you read uh, these wonderful uh, volumes, um, uh, the Gospel of Solentiname, for instance, by uh, your merry old brother, uh, Ernesto Cardinal, uh, uh, it, it, it's remarkable uh, what these very simple, mostly uneducated people come up with to, to integrate uh, the gospel in their lives. And I think if we could do that and we can, you know, in the spirit of synodality, trust people uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to do this as we, as we pray and we're open to the spirit, I think that could be one way of doing it. 
I mean, another way might also be, you know, in terms of, um, you know, uh, different teachings or doctrines or things like that to, to kind of, let, let's talk about this. What, what might this mean? I think that's the, the, the task of a, of a skilled pastor, too, you know, who really knows theology and is able to, you know, bring this stuff uh, 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 and make it, make it relevant. Uh, I remember years ago on a, a lecture that um, my doctor father, uh, Thomas O'Mara, gave uh, he, he told us, he said, you know, those of you who are studying theology need to have a lot of RAM, random access memory, you know. You, you, you need to know, uh, you know, a lot of stuff so you can pull it quickly when you're talking with people. That's why we study theology. You know, that's why, you know, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's, it's to have this, this kind of pastoral agility uh, to, to do this and help people. You know, that, you know, having gone through it ourselves, that we can help people to come to some kind of deeper faith as well. I mean, it's a, it's a difficult, difficult question, uh, Matthew, but I think this is, this is our great pastoral task. Uh, it really is, you know. It's not, again, to impose doctrine on people. It's to, it's to, um, uh, it, it's to touch the faith that's so often already there in their hearts. And, and, to, and, to, and to bring it out. We snow. Thank you so much for the presentation. So one thing I think that European Christian today have to know is the way Christianity came to America. Christianity did not come in a sweeter way. It was imposed on the indigenous mm -hmm. people yeah. and the slave, even Pope Alexander the Six, right. gave the right to Portugal yeah. and Doctrine the, of Discovery. For, for Spain <laughs> yeah. to conquer the, the whole Americas. Yeah. If the, the, the European fight, no Christian on the land, forced them to convert and then a lot of them yeah. died. Yeah. So the images we have today in our culture represent our identity. Mm -hmm. It represents the way we survive because yeah. at doing the type of slavery, the master asked the slave, this is what to yeah. do. This yeah. is the image you have to go to church. Yeah. But the slave, they have their own culture, they have their own identity or yeah. their own yeah. religion. Right. In order to survive, mm -hmm. they pretended that, okay, you ask me to pray in front of Mary, I pray. But behind, they have their God that pray. And mm -hmm. I think yeah. they have to respect uh, yeah. people's yeah. culture, yeah. not only culture, but also the yeah. images that represent who they are. No, thank you, Wisno. I mean, that's, you know, it's absolutely true. And I, I think, you know, I um, can't remember where I, where I, I said it. Uh, it's relatively recently. I said, when we talk about mission, we have to do it in deep humility and repentance. You know, there's no question about it. I mean, you know, they were, they were, um, uh, uh, sincere men, there were very few women at the beginning, you know, uh, 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 of the missionaries, uh, they were sincere, but they were very, very misguided, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and, and I think we have to, we have to recognize, recognize that and acknowledge that. But also, you know, uh, recognize the, the role of the Holy Spirit in there, as, you know, as I said before, somehow or another, it, it, it got through, you know. But I think we have to just forget this kind of way of thinking about mission. I gave um, a talk at the 500th um, anniversary celebration of the evangelization of the Philippines uh, back in April. And uh, uh, one of the things that I talked about, you probably know this uh, already, but the switch in mission from talking about mission ad gentes where you target people and you go out there and you know and try to corral them, you know, to mission intergentes, you know, that you live among people, you know, and you learn from them and you and you you share their their customs and so forth. You you embody you embody Christ. You embody God, the incarnate God. That's what mission is about. That's what Jesus did when Jesus when when the Word became flesh. 
you know, and that's what we need to do as we go on mission. They didn't understand that back in the 16th century, sadly, you know, sadly, but, but, but more than sadly, tragically, you know, but, uh, but let's, not, let's not do that now. Okay. I'm fine. I'm, fine. <laughs> I, I'm a teacher, you know. <laughs> Oh, sure, fine. 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 There's somebody over here. <laughs> um, good evening to all. So, so English is my second language. So sometimes it will be very hard for me to express my inner thinking. Anyway, I have, uh, I don't know what is about this culture and history, but I noticed only one thing. But when the wooden, wooden statue, the wooden image pregnant lady offered to Pope Francis, it was refused to accept because it is considered as idolatry, is totally against our Catholic Church. Uh, no, that, uh, uh, that is not true. Uh, if you watch the video, um, I, in my text, I have, a, I have a link to the YouTube video. And uh, uh, these people, they line up and they present these gifts to Pope Francis and they present the, the statue to him and he takes it. And he blesses the person. You know, I mean, it's very, very moving. Uh, so, so take a look at that. He did not refuse it. But it was refused by someone, maybe cardinals? Um, I, I, well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, Cardinal Mueller didn't like it. Okay. Uh, so, and, uh, <laughs> so it is the concept of this. It shows that that wooden lady shows the idolatry. But what is the difference between idolatry and uh, statues? It is the only name gives mm -hmm. the meaning for it. Yeah, uh, a a a statue or. You know, this was this is a big controversy in the sixth to the eighth centuries in uh, in Greece called the iconoclastic controversy. Um, uh, some people thought that the icons that were in the churches there were uh, idols, and uh, a lot of it was because of some Muslim influence. You know, the the Muslims were at their doorsteps, and and in fact, some were even you know uh, ruled by uh, by Islam. Uh, and they began to say, oh, these icons are, their idols, you know, and actually, you know, it's people like uh, John Chrysostom, for instance, would say, no, the difference between an idol and, and an icon is that an idol is, we, we see it and we take it literally and, and we try to use it to manipulate God, you know, where an icon, we see through the image into what into what the image points toward, so that's the that's the difference, you know. And and in our and 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 this is you know really important for our Catholic imagination, is that we we have all these things, you know, rosaries and statues and and sacraments and all that stuff. They are not magic things. They are rather they are rather ways to which we can see through them into the mystery of God. Okay. okay. Yeah, hi, Steve. Um, our next question oh. from Zoom comes from Carmel. From Carmen Nanco? No, it says Car Carmel. Oh, Carmel, okay. Yeah. I thought, uh-oh. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question is, can you comment on the present church climate that continues to exclude any experience of enculturation in the liturgy and provides us an example, Pope Francis' recent visit to Canada to the First Nations in which uh, rituals and symbols that belong to the First Nations were, were deliberately excluded from the liturgies? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think that's, I, I, I look at I look at Annie over here, and I, 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 I it just really goes against ultimately uh, what 
what Vatican II, we're celebrating the 60th anniversary of the start of Vatican II today, as Barbara pointed out, of what Vatican II says in, in uh, paragraph 37, is that right, Annie, uh, of uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium, the document on the liturgy. You know, I mean, the, the, the Vatican Council really wanted us to experiment in, in this direction. And I think Pope Francis would be more open to that. I mean, you saw him with headdresses and things like that, and you've seen Pope Francis like that. Well, even Pope Francis with the, the big chief's headdress and things like that. Uh, but um, but it, it, there, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's, it's really sad that there are ways of, of incorporating, um, you know, culture, context with a wider understanding of culture uh, into our, our liturgical celebrations. Uh, and I think until we do that, I think we're not being faithful to the dream of the council. Uh, and then, okay. Thank you very much for your talk, which resonated very much with this Protestant in the audience. Oh. Uh, for communities in the church that have for centuries exerted privilege and power, whether it be gender or uh, nationality or race, it seems that perhaps there needs to be a process of de-enculturation. So I'm wondering what the methodology of de-enculturation might look like. Hmm. Um. I'm not sure if I would use that term. I, I, I'm not sure, but um, I know in, in, in feminist theology, you talk about relinquishment. Uh, is that right, Barbara? Uh, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that men need to relinquish privilege. I think you know, whites need to relinquish privilege, this, this kind of thing. So maybe, maybe that's, uh, to me, that maybe is more, uh, more the, the point. Uh, um, I, th I think what we need to do is maybe not, not de-enculturate, but recognize how enculturated we already are. That this is not some kind of, you know, uh, super truth expression of Christianity. It's, it's an expression of, of Christianity that is, that is deeply, in many ways, enculturated in our own cultures and biases and you know gender biases and things and things like that you know so so if you want to use that term okay i think um, um, but I, I i almost feel like what we have to do is recognize i'm going to use a nasty word here the relativity of our understandings of uh, of of christianity and, and that way, I think, you know, th that really makes us free. You know, I, I was just reading um, it's a wonderful article uh, in uh, the current issue of Commonweal about the uh, Latina artist, uh, I think her name is Yolanda Lopez, I, I think that's, and uh, it's, uh, uh, she does these very um, provocative uh, in, 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 you know, uh, uh, images of Our Lady of Guadalupe. She paints her grandmother as Our Lady of Guadalupe and so forth. Uh, and they're very powerful. It's, read the article, it's great. But, you know, she, she said, it's really interesting because she said, you know, that uh, people, uh, 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 Lopez lived in, um, in, in uh, San Diego at the end of her life and that people would you know break her windows they would g give death threats because of you know her her way of really trying to enculturate even this enculturation um, and and uh, she said it's interesting this reminded me of the Pachamama controversy uh, and and says you know why don't we all recognize the fact that we can not never ever grasp the mystery of God. And that, you know, what theology is really, I mean, and, and culturation is theology, it's, you know, and, uh, it, it's play. It's playing, it's, it's checking, well, how would this work? How would this work? You know, does this resonate with me? You know, so this, this kind of, uh, you, you know, Ton says it so well, you know, with, with this idea, it's an art, you know, uh, and it's, it's an art, uh, and, and um, that's what we need. I think. So, yeah, anyway. 
Good. Thank you very much, Steve. It's so, so wonderful to see a teacher at work, you know? You do your presentation, and then So wonderful to be teaching. <laughs> you know, and engaging the questions, and thank you for being very open. I mean, I know that's who you are. I know that already, but uh, for really engaging the questions. And I think the implications of what we're talking about are, are very profound for us, and we touched upon some major things facing us in that day. And I know you said, what can we learn? How can the indigenous teach us? My own experience, and you know, it's over the years, whether it was in Papua New Guinea or the last 30 years with the Lakota people, what I've been able to learn from the indigenous peoples, you know? For example, many of you know with the Lakota, the Matakiwasan, all my relatives, that's the way they end all their prayers and rituals and teaching how we're connected, the ecological, connecting the ecology with our Christian faith and everything. It's just, it's a wonderful, I've learned, continue to learn much from the indigenous peoples there. So I really appreciate that. So um, again, uh, thank you very much, Steve. It's very good. Uh, thank you. Yeah.